and Swart book. Uh, I hope you have a copy of it. I know people are having problems finding it from Follett. Uh, anyway, we're going to tackle chapter two today, Dependency, Despondency, and Depression. Sounds really sad, but well, let's get, go ahead and get started. Not only does the internet and in particular its proliferating social media platforms provide a virtual social and entertainment haven, even a place for posturing and braggadocio, for those who are prone to awkwardness, seclusion, and other interpersonal dysfunctionality in offline environments, but it also it is also the ideal battlefield for fear mongers, hate mongers, propagandists, and unscrupulous corporations, as well as advocacy groups which want to promote their agendas with no moderation regarding truth or moral responsibility. In the 2016 U.S. presidential election, the Russian troll farm was allegedly behind this influence campaign at the center of the ensuing FBI and House Intelligence Committee investigations. Of course, they did not invent fake news. However, the flagrancy with which they were alleged to have acted held a mirror up to the several hundred million social media users to reveal something no one wanted to admit. People were addicted to the Internet. Many people describe themselves as being continuously connected without interruption to social media or some application of the internet on a daily and even an hourly basis. This still comparatively new reality of daily occupational and social functioning underscores just how significantly the def definition of acceptable behavior versus repetitive and compulsive behavior that interferes with the same social and occupational functioning, and thus classifies the behavior as disordered, has changed in only a matter of years. Uh, I can remember teaching uh, that if you checked your cell phone more than, more than three times a day, that you were obsessed. Uh, this was this was uh, this came out uh, you know five or ten years ago, um, and now you know people are constantly checking their phones. The DSM-5 proposes nine diagnostic criteria, criteria for internet gaming linked to persistent and recurrent solo or multiplayer gaming on the internet that causes significant impairment or distress in one or more areas of, of, of a person's life. To qualify for a clinical diagnosis, five or more of the following elements must be present in, in the most recent 12-month period. One, the individual has become preoccupied with internet games, which overshadows all other activities and responsibilities in everyday life. Two, when access to the internet is prohibited or restricted, the individual becomes irritable, anxious, or sad, which represents withdrawal symptoms. The ba number three, baseline tolerance is progressively raised, meaning that the person increasingly feels the urge to spend more time online. Number four, the person is not able to control his or her gaming behavior, often having had multiple unsuccessful attempts or resolutions to curb playing internet games. Number five, wait a minute, ouch, I'm sorry, I had to let the dogs out, go. Number five, the person has lost interest in activities and hobbies that were previously enjoyable at the expense of internet games. Number six, the individual is aware of psychosocial issues or distress as a result of his or her internet gaming, but persists with the be behavior. The person, Number seven, the person lies to or deceives friends, family, therapists, or others, or hides from them the extent of their internet gaming participation. Number eight, internet games are used as an escape mechanism or relief from psychological distress, such as depression, guilt, anxiety, or self-loathing. Number nine, as a result of his or her gaming, the individual has lost or compromised valuable life opportunities, such as a job, career advancement, education, or interpersonal relationship. According to the DSM, uh, internet gaming addiction is most prevalent among 12 to 20-year-old male adolescents from Asian countries, in particular 
uh, China and South Korea. Prevalence of internet addiction among adolescents in these countries was 8.4% for males and 4.5% for females. One German study suggested that 1.5 to 3.5% of adolescent computer and internet users show signs of an overuse or addictive use of computer and video games. So what we're seeing is in Asia, we see a lot more of this than we do in, say, Germany. Uh, you, because these figures are much lower than these figures. Addiction is generally defined as, an in, as, a, as any dependence that results in signs of withdrawal once the dependency is removed without proper and controlled weaning. Like any addiction, dependence on the Internet is similar to other compulsive behaviors that can have both physical and psychological triggers. <clears throat> Addictions can cause mood problems such as depression and anxiety, both of which are confirmed as the leading side effects of dependency on uh, not so much of the internet itself, but on social media applications. Spending more time on the internet lessens both the duration and quality of one's sleep, which increases mood imbalances and psychosomatic symptoms, including headaches and recurrent abdominal pain. Internet addictions appear to have a direct link to depression and suicidal ideation, exacerbated by the social isolation that other documented addictive behaviors often produce. Research has found a significant, cor significant correlation okay, uh, between internet usage, depression, and low self-esteem among the participants presenting with internet addiction. Research of university students in Iran found more than 40% of the sample of 408 students had an internet addiction, higher than global estimates of 5 to 10% of total internet users worldwide. Males were far more likely to become internet dependent and argued that it is due to more experience in internet usage, less parental supervision, and higher use for entertainment purposes. This corroborates the long-standing psychological understanding that males are more visually oriented than females, who tend to be more sensory by comparison. But it might also reflect traditional gender roles with respect to computing technologies. Increased internet usage is related to an overall decrease in the quality of social interactions and increased loneliness which contributes to depressed feelings and self-esteem problems. Research from the university, uh, a university in Turkey found that almost three-fourths of the 3,442 participants began to use the Internet before age 13. Almost the same percentage reported using the Internet for social friendships, while nearly half went online because of loneliness and two out of five for entertainment. Research showed an almost perfect linear correlation between the young internet addiction and Beck depression inventory scores, with respondents whose parents both work and had chronic diseases at higher risk. Problems with school, health, family, and time management also seem to stimulate internet addictive behaviors. While an addiction may represent an attempt to manage or cope with internalized distress, such as depression and anxiety, the latter is also a reflection of deeper insecurities and beliefs of hopelessness and unworthiness. These feelings are rooted in a deep-seated subconscious effort to achieve the desired personality or social standing or to relieve internal distress as a type of escape mechanism. One well-known condition developed by uh, the need to escape from or survive life-threatening circumstances such as severe childhood abuse and trauma is dissociative identity disorder, or DID. In dissociative identity disorder, identities and personalities are detached and compartmentalized uh, to achieve a life-saving goal primarily to protect the body and original core identity from pain and stress that they are not equipped to deal with, thereby enabling the person to function normally as if the trauma never happened. 
Those already predisposed to compartmentalize and fragment personalities are more likely to grab onto the possibilities of virtual anonymity and identity fabrication offered by the Internet. They may believe themselves to be part of multiple systems, whether or not they are legitimately sharing a physical body with distinct personalities rather than suffering from a psychotic or intense dissociative condition. Behavior and presentation on the social media platforms often mimic a multiplication of dissociation of identities, albeit, uh, in, uh, albeit voluntary and deliberate. Such a dimmy uh, dissociation can be relatively harmless, but can also approach something akin to cyber dissociative identity disorder, which leads to a chronic neglect of the individual's real life and identity and a, and a persistent incoherence of multiple personalities. Uh, and what we're really talking about are avatars, people creating avatars for this game or that game, and suddenly they are identifying with those avatars more than they are with who they really are. A study of 179 undergraduate students in Iran concluded that internet dependence presented significantly higher thrills in sensation-seeking, disinhibition, and boredom susceptibility traits than the non-dependents. Researchers also suspected that mental or virtual sensation might be a primary motivation of this type of internet-addicted individual. Although the findings aptly describe one type of internet addict, other studies suggest an additional second type. The dependent personality type is likely to be more prone to anxiety and depression based on underlying beliefs of not being good enough and not having hope for the future and corresponding with low self-esteem and social awkwardness. People with this personality type are likely to be victimized online or engage in reactive cyberbully victim behaviors. Psychopathic personality type is completely different. They are dependent on internet use purely for the satisfaction, sexual and psychological, of the experience. They seek out ex excitement and revel in, the, uh, in uh, creating problems for others which they often pursue by creating false impressions and power differentials. They have to win, and they do so by denigrating others. They're easily bored and not disposed to anxiety or depression. This is a psychopathic personality. Higher levels of metacognition and emotional intelligence seem to counter or moderate the propensity for addictive behavior. It is, uh, it is specific dimensions and orientations of metacognition that predict addiction potential. The role of three parameters is of great importance, namely to need to control thoughts, uncontrollability, and positive beliefs about worry. There is typically an impairment uh, in metacognition mastery among persons with addictions, which is characterized by difficulties in moderating mental states. Sub-average emotional intelligence is a predictor of internet addiction, while its development is also being hindered by the behavior, being cut off from social interaction as a source of reinforcement and being deprived of alternative perspectives intensifies existing dysfunctional beliefs about the sources and use of power, control and respect, and other problematic cognitive thoughts common in antisocial personalities. Those with severe internet dependency also reported low social support, a lack of life purpose, and an unclear sense of direction. These traits are also hallmarks of psychopathic tendencies for which obsessive internet use, including violent and pornographic entertainment, gaming and gambling, and cyberbullying are suitable and reinforcing. We're talking about uh, a lot of uh, uh, negative personality types. The, uh, the uh, psychopath, uh, psychopathic antisocial personality disorder. While high excitability, low reward dependence, low self-esteem, and poor family function predicted emergence of internet dependence, low hostility and low interpersonal sensitivity are linked to remission. 
lying, sensation-seeking, irritation, and anger are characteristic traits of internet-dependent users. Now, you may have noticed one thing. We're seeing a lot of Apple computers. There's another Apple. Wait a minute. I think we are. Aren't we? Well, that's not an Apple. That's not an Apple. Okay. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just too sensitive. I have an Apple computer. <laughs> Okay. Internet usage uh, among adolescents could be a form of identity exploration rather than an impulse control disorder. And this is one of the things that you have to remember. Maybe they're just looking for their future. Maybe they're trying to identify who they are. And that's fine. That's not uh, internet addiction. Researchers have argued that young people might view and experience the internet as a place for ego development and shaping of self-consciousness and self-concept clarity, which implies that internet addicts might have a less than age average developed uh, stable identity. There is a need to differentiate between heavy internet users who may be utilizing the internet for age-related development purposes uh, and addicted users who are more likely to exhibit fixed personality or psychological dysfunctions. And of course, if we're dealing with uh, your teenagers, then one of the things that we need to do is determine whether it's one or the other. In 2014, study among 17, uh, 719 Japanese adolescents in Hong Kong indicated a strong correlation between internet addiction and insomnia, with the latter significantly uh, associated with depression. The study found that smartphones and other internet-enabled devices is actually reshaping the human brain among younger generations. And this is really kind of scary if you think about it, that our brains are being restructured by, by the internet. The brain restructuring includes a noted decrease in alpha wave uh, activity, the electrical currents that facilitate deep sleep, among internet-dependent teens managing numerous social media profiles simultaneously. Okay, so because their alpha wave sleep, uh, alpha waves are disrupted, uh, it's restructuring their brain, they wake up during the night. We're going to talk about this in, a, in just a second. This includes natural circadian patterns being interrupted as the body's internal alarm clock is being rewired to wake every few hours for the purpose of checking one's social media profiles. And probably your kids don't have this kind of a problem, but there are people out there that do have this problem. With diminished sleep quality over the long term being linked to increased psychological stress, depression, and digestion issues, in turn facilitating further mental health and self-esteem issues related to body image, diet, and lethargy, we see that social media dependency vis-a-vis -vis, uh, internet addiction is linked to sleep disturbances that have both physiological and psychological effects of an enormously and de uh, demonstrably detrimental nature on par with the effects of both alcohol and drug abuse. In other words, it's just as bad as, get, as being a drunk or uh, using drugs. For those with insomnia as a primary condition, excessive internet use mediated the pathway to depression, while for those with internet addiction as a primary condition, insomnia is an outcome linked to depression. The same applies to the social isolation that accompanies excessive internet use and is linked to feelings of loneliness, alienation, incompetence, and other depressive symptoms that can intensify over time and block the social skills development that is required to establish and maintain healthy relationships. A study among 1,808 junior high school students in Taiwan associated lower levels of parental attachment with internet addiction, cyberbullying, smoking, alcohol use, and depression. Of the participants, 15.5% uh, were classified as having internet addiction, with a higher proportion of males than the non-addicted group, 61.4% versus 45.9%. In addition to spending more time on gaming and social network sites, the addicted group was also more exposed to online pornography and violence. Both cyberbully victimization and perpetration levels 
were significantly higher than their non-addicted peers, as well as online sexual solicitation, victimization, and perpetration. In the Taiwanese research, a significantly higher proportion of the internet addicted group smoked and consumed alcohol, while they reported about twice the level of low self-esteem and depression than their peers. Internet addiction was positively correlated with maleness, poor academic performance, and lower internet literacy and parental styles with lower attachment, safety, and restrictive mediation. The satisfaction of relationships with their parents was less among those with internet addiction compared to others. Another social dynamic that relates to internet-related depression and suicidal ideation is the pressure, often self-imposed, of being incessantly plugged in and continuously available and accessible via social media. In some sense, the adolescent in particular invests emotionally in his or her connections and image online, which is an unrealistic yardstick for success, relevance, and self-worth, and is inherently predisposed to failure. Everyone from friends and enemies to those with commercial interests presents a perfect picture of success and attractiveness that is often only surface deep, or otherwise part of a blatant lie and disingenuous a narrative being cultivated, edited, and carefully curated in social media spaces to present a certain life brand. These are the influencers that you care so much about. <clears throat> the Kardashians, the Bella, Bella Porches. Uh, these are the influencers. Uh, the Siwas. I can't remember what her first name is. Jojo Siwa. That's, she's an influencer. Such presentations are taken seriously, while one's own perceived shortcomings, either real or perceived, are intensified in their hurtfulness based on irrational comparisons to others. A detailed uh, 2013 study in the uh, United Kingdom, where more than 30,000 14 and 15 year old teens were questioned, found that 37% of girls experience one or more symptoms of diminished mental health, 37%. That's one third of the, of the population. This is more than twice the rate compared to their male peers. And what is even more alarming is that the prevalence of emotional distress is worsening. It's up from a reported 34% in 2005. An interesting trend that was highlighted by the uh, UK study is that high-risk behavior among teenagers is at an all-time low, with drinking, drug use, unprotected sex, pregnancy, and truancy all reducing, uh, consider, re being reduced uh, considerably in the context of growing depression and anxiety. Social media can easily become a tool of comparison with others, one that is guaranteed to leave all but the most self-assured and resilient child feeling that he or she is falling short of expectations. Social media postings almost seem set up to increase a person's feeling of inadequacy as they navigate a world filled with lies, inaccuracies, personal agendas, and institutional exploitation. It is likely that technology can act as a tipping point by intensifying insecurities and feelings of being overwhelmed. Half of the UK respondents reported social media had changed their lives. Wow. <laughs> the concept of upward comparison refers to those instances when a person compares uh, themselves with an uh, individual or group uh, that they perceive to be in a superior position in any valued aspect. However, while upward comparisons may provide inspiration to improve, they can also lower self-esteem and generate feelings of inadequacy. With social media content edging to the extreme opposites of happiness and adversity, the middle ground is apparently considered boring. Many users assume a relatively fixed spot, largely through selective and benign postings, shares, and follower or friend requests. This means that many people only or primarily post content that aligns with their chosen personal brand and response uh, that they want to elicit. For those connected to them, this tendency can create a skewed perception of success 
and accomplishment as failures and disappointments are not shared. This is a sort of confirmation bias, or the tendency to search for, interpret, focus on, and remember information that confirms a preconception. Oh, brilliant. That's a really a clean room. See? It's clean! <laughs> Context collapse describes a set of circumstances where a social media user realizes that talking to everyone is the same as talking to no one. There is an infinite audience possible on social media. However, in contrast to the limited groups that a person usually interacts with face-to-face, -face, it becomes impossible to adjust the tone, presentation, and content of the message to fit into the social context. Context collapse. It is likely that context collapse is followed by a reconstruction of the self that is more suitable to a new con conceptualization of the generalized others with who the individual desires to connect. Professional users report that in order to build and satisfy an audience, a balance between personal authenticity and audience expectation must be achieved, which requires personal revelations and identity presentations. Information from everywhere is instantly available to everyone. This fishbowl effect magnifies fear and shame in social media spaces to a point where they become all-consuming. Impossible models of perfection and malicious, attention-seeking strategies increase internal stress to the point that complete and often extreme disengagement, both online and offline alike, is the only solution. And there's the rock. This is the rock. That's, I can't remember her name. Uh, anyway, I was thinking it was Jenny McCarthy, but I, I don't think it is. The constant awareness of one's actions that someone is always watching increases paranoia, anxiety, and depression. When the impact of a message is different from the, its intent by being misconstrued or taken out of context, often deliberately, a heroin experience can quickly develop where wrong response choices can lead to serious consequences. And this is a joke, but it's fairly real. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you can be, uh, can be taken out of context and put on Twitter, and then it'll be a whole thing. Uh, Self-censoring becomes an instinctive norm to try and navigate possible dangers ahead. People are dismissed or chastised for changing their opinions, disagreeing with someone, however amenable, and doing something that is not deemed cool enough. The Hawthorne effect, similar to the fishbowl effect, occurs when individuals change an aspect of their behavior when they are aware of or believe that they are being watched, a familiar sensation when engaging on the internet. Today, individuals and groups are able to cleverly manipulate digital information and interactions to stir conflict by pitting people against each other to achieve an objective, political, commercial, or otherwise. It is, it is a tactic used by governments, corporations, terrorists, activists, trolls, and others uh, for their own agenda and satisfaction. As the need to belong is the most fundamental human motivation, most people find it hard not to choose sides in an ever-increasing polarity of opinions and beliefs. Lies and bias are expediently used to gain support in the short term, while long-term and individual consequences are ignored. Social media plays a role in encouraging social polarization. There is already ample evidence to suggest this is a widespread phenomenon, yet one still largely unnoticed as social media and news sites enable content based on users' preferences and online behavior. The concept of a post-truth world is also employed where information is framed and debate is stimulated by appeals to the emotions of an audience rather than being connected to facts. This leads to stratified audiences where one group follows an entirely different stream of information and news than others. 
Such polarization then becomes adjunct to other forms of conflict as it demonizes enemies, lionizes the characteristics, or whitewashes the flaws and mistakes of one's own group. This is a joke. This is uh, uh, Descartes, and he wisely said once upon a time, I think, therefore I am, and of course this is uh, in the modern world, I believe, therefore I'm right. Uh, post-truth, that's what they're talking about, post-truth. Uh, alternative facts, uh, we started hearing the, the concept of alternative facts in, in 2017 uh, when Trump would say something and then uh, they would prove that it was wrong and then he would talk about alternative facts. He also talked about fake news a lot. Uh, was he really talking about fake news? No, he was talking about news that didn't agree with him. Uh, so, you know, this is these are post-truth. We are in the post-truth era. With all groups self-righteous and disconnected, a recipe for disaster is in the making. Eventually, most people on all sides are left disenchanted and alienated, which, when in the context of adverse circumstances and a lack of material support, increases the risk of mental health problems, especially those that are predisposed to such conditions that tend to increase the burden on themselves and others. Anger and ag aggravation are, are two of the main causes of, uh, of mental problems. Many individual and unaffiliated perpetrators of mass murder, such as school shooters and lone wolf terrorists, suffer from some kind of mental condition other than a personality disorder, in addition to feeling aggrieved and socially isolated. The most common problems are disorders such as paranoid schizophrenia and depression among this group that almost entirely consist of adolescent or young adult males. Many have also experienced a history of traumatization. And these are some school shooters. This is the kid that shot up Sandy Hook. This is Klebold and Harris right here. Uh, I think this is the guy that shot up uh, Virginia, Virginia Tech. On May 23rd, uh, 2014, 22-year-old Elliot Roger killed six people and injured 14 others in Isla uh, Vista near the uh, campus of the University of California, Santa Barbara, before shooting himself to death. Roger had a history of mental illness and was treated for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. He frequently posted rantings about his despair and rejection by women on social media, including a stack of selfies and dozens of YouTube videos complaining about the world's unfairness and his desire for revenge for his life of involuntary celibacy. And we saw him right here. A socially awkward loner named Alec Manassian, uh, claiming allegiance to, to secret online society of incel, involuntary celibacy adherents, users uh, who also identified as, okay, uh, pledged allegiance to Elliot Roger on Facebook as the incel group's founder and martyr. He then used a rented cargo van to plow through pedestrians along Toronto's famed Yonge Street, on the uh, city's warmest day of the year to date, his in, in intentionally targeting female pedestrians in particular. In, in, in the end, he killed 10 people and injured another 13. These guys are on the same team. All right, they're both incels. Christopher Harper Mercer, who killed nine people at um, uh, Umpqua uh, Community College near Roseburg, uh, Oregon, on October 1st, 2015, had previously praised Vester Lee Flanagan online in a social media post that apparently went unrecognized for what they actually were. Flanagan had himself murdered two former colleagues from a Roanoke, Virginia television station during a live broadcast on August 26, 2015. On his part, in a 23-page manifesto faxed to, a, faxed to ABC News, Flanagan had referenced Dylan Roof, a young white man accused of murdering nine people at an African-American church in Charleston, South Carolina, on June 17, 2015. 
Apparently, Flanagan was enraged at Roof and was motivated to incite a race war. And we can see Dylan Roof is right. Wait a minute. This is Dylan Roof, I believe. Oh, no, that's not. These young men were angry and depressed and used... This is Dylan Roof. Yeah, that's Dylan Roof. These young men were angry and depressed and used social media not only to vent, but also to look for and connect with others with the same inspiration and needs. As such, a combination of depression, psychosocial adversity, and lack of social assets is instrumental in the vulnerability to violent radicalization. A process known as cyber balkanization is similarly thought to be instrumental to the division and alienation of individuals and groups in social media and elsewhere online. Also referred to as the splinternet, internet audiences are splintering and dividing due to different factors such as politics, nationalism, religion, technological and financial abilities, and other special interests delineated uh, along the lines of difference rather than likeness. What is frequently referred to in uh, public forums and mass media as identity politics. Uh, so why balkanization? Uh, I think they explained it in the book, but I, I didn't explain it to you. The Balkans are uh, in Eastern Europe. It's uh, Greece, uh, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, um, uh, Macedonia, uh, former Yugoslavia. That's Those are the Balkans. And, and uh, between uh, the turn of the 20th century and World War I, uh, that area was constantly in conflict. Nobody could figure out who was in charge. Uh, they were The Macedonians were killing the Greeks. The Greeks were killing the Romanians. The Romanians were killing the Bulgarians. The Slovenians were killing the uh, Serbs. The Serbs were killing the Croats. There was just this constant warfare going on. Um, and a lot of it was guerrilla warfare. Uh, it was ugly, it was brutal, uh, and uh, this became uh, the, the, the Balkans. So after World War I, one of the things that the, uh, the League of Nations did, uh, they separated all of these countries. They tried to put all of these groups of individuals, Albania was one of them, they tried to put all these groups of individuals that were similar to each other in their own country so they'd stop killing each other. It didn't work, and, and actually... The uh, war between, uh, or the war started uh, when a Serb, uh, all, all of these countries had, had belonged to uh, Austria. They, Austria had, had tried to control all of these countries, and it really didn't work. And it was a Serb that assassinated the Archduke Ferdinand that started World War I. Well, after World War I, they tried to, to stop all of the, this fighting. It really didn't work. During World War II, uh, um, uh, because of the balkanization, because of this div division, uh, this fractionation of people, uh, the, the war was extremely brutal in that part of the world. And part of that is, East, is Western Ukraine became involved in that, this whole balkanization process. And a lot of what the Russians are talking about and what the Russians are mad about is that, see, Western Ukraine used to be uh, they were German-speaking people. They weren't Russian-speaking people or Ukrainian-speaking people. They were German-speaking people. So when the Germans came in, when they conquered that portion of uh, Russia during World War II, they tried to ship some of these people back, and they became uh, part of their military. They, they uh, uh, were able to recruit uh, troops out of uh, Ukraine, the German-speaking portion of Ukraine, and it got just really brutal and ugly. Um, and, of course, the, uh, the Russians claim that the same thing was happening right now, and that's one of the reasons why they invaded the Ukraine, because they said the, they, were, they were turning into Nazis again. They were turning into fascists, as interesting as that is. Anyway, okay, so that's balkanization. The Balkans are the, uh, is that area of Eastern Europe. Uh, Albania, Greece, Macedonia, Slovenia, Slovakia, well not Slovakia, it's, it's in Western Europe, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, all of those countries were 
uh, were a mess. And as soon as Yugoslavia broke up, of course, then a war started between the Croats and the Serbs. Uh, so, you know, this this hatred between all of these people, that, there's a lot of strange things. The Croats and Serbs speak the same language, but they don't write with the same alphabet. Uh, the Serbs write with a, a Cyrillic alphabet, the, the same alphabet that the uh, uh, Russians use. And the uh, Croats, uh, and, and they're Serbian Orthodox, so they're Orthodox like the Russians are. And the uh, Croats are, are a Catholic, Roman Catholic, and they uh, they write in the uh, Roman uh, alphabet. So they write, you know, the letters they make are the same as ours. As weird as all that sounds, but boy, they really got into a mess. And of course, Kosovo Kosovo was part of the problem. And yeah, it just got ugly, it got real ugly real fast. The internet disrupts people's ties with their neighbors, coworkers, and personal friends by atomizing societies into online communities that are more dispersed and faceless. While the internet and online communication can also be the source of a new, equally satisfying and constructive social capital, atomization can lead to loneliness and isolation and sometimes outgroup antagonism that is linked to depression. The idea is that a person projects his or her pre-existing vulnerabilities online, resulting in a similar feedback of multifold proportions. This happens because people instinctively act according to their subconscious fears, which can be a, in a passive or active, engaging or avoiding, or defensive or aggressive manner. And that's passive aggression. While appearing completely and non-judgmental and unattached, content on the internet is also generated by individuals with an agenda and objectives that are sometimes elusive or misguided. Reminiscent of the Roman orator and statesman Marcus Tullius Cicero, who in his speech to the Roman consul asked, Qui bono? The same should be asked today of, of media content. To whose benefit? Who's benefiting from this? Uh, it's an old adage to explore a hidden motive or to suggest that information is not as it appears. In an online environment where truth has been largely displaced by believability, objectivity is an ever more scarce commodity. Those in ruthless pursuit of ill-gotten gains rut routinely try to exploit our consumers who are more gullible, susceptible, or trustful. They utilize the features of the new technologies, such as filter bubbles, to make themselves and their cause seem credible and believable without regard for potential consequences on the lives of their audiences. Filter bubbles refer to the discrete result of a personalized search in which the algorithm of a search engine or social media website predicts the information that a user wants to see based on his or her characteristics and ex extant online behavior, which has, of course, been uh, tracked since the day that the same user activated an account on a given platform or allowed a given app access to their data. In a sense, the internet becomes less of a connection to the world and more of a manipulated flow of data that can become divergent from an accurate, bigger picture. Ultimately, the effect is that people are removed, even shielded in a sense, from news, views, and opinions that they might not like or care for. It is not difficult to understand how this, these filter bubbles can isolate a given internet user from different perspectives, thereby increasing polarization and eliminating the middle ground and space for compromise. Instead of constructive debate, conflict, polarization, and even radicalization ensues with a given digital space enabling exercises in blaming and scapegoating and with the cultivation of intense emotions and grievances, which in the context of real world personal adversaries, adversities, can easily become unmanageable. And that's, this is uh, 8chan and this is Stormfront, two very radical uh, websites. 
In response to this factionalism, social media administrators and moderators, often required to espouse the political and ideological leanings of their parent companies, strive to minimize publicly viewable conflict by suppressing dissenting, typically center or right of center views, by circuitously muzzling prominent agitators, pundits, and any user not engaging in overtly illegal hate speech. Shadow banning euphemized as an abuser filter, an abuse filter by Twitter, Instagram, and other social media platforms is a furtive me method used to filter objectionable content automatically. As a result, content that is deemed abusive, hateful, or offensive is hidden from users' timelines, which limits its reach without deleting, deleting it or suspending the contributor's account. The contributor in question also typically remains unaware that they have been exiled and their content has been filtered, given that his or her own timeline indicates nothing has changed and that it is business as usual. It appears that free speech and healthy debate are the victims of deliberate censorship designed to silence the voices of dissent. It is curiously ironic, then, that the loss of personal identity and the rise of identity politics are sim simultaneously contoured around specific social media platforms, some more than others. And that is the end. Shadow ban. Okay. So next week, we'll tackle something else. Uh, I know this was kind of depressing. It gets even more depressing uh, the farther we get into this stuff. So uh, just be aware. Uh, we're <laughs> we're going to talk about uh, uh, pornography, of course, uh, which is, you know, that's part of social media, strangely. Uh, anyway, so that's uh, in the future. <laughs>